Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'd like to welcome you to this Monday Minute live chat hosted by the Canadian Leadership Congress. Today, we're talking about the state of infrastructure in Canada right now with Aaron Corey, Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Helen. and thank you very much for having me. Great. Well, look, I'm going to start uh, by cutting right to the chase. What is the state of Canada's infrastructure today? And can you break it down into the maybe the good, the bad and the ugly? Sure. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Infrastructure, of course, first of all, you have to start by uh, maybe defining a little bit what we mean by infrastructure, because not everyone carries the same definition. But for my purposes, at least when we talk about it, we mean all of the elements of physical infrastructure that supports both economic and social growth. It's publicly used typically, or has public benefit at least. And generally we think of it in the big categories of energy, transit and transportation, digital infrastructure, uh, water and wastewater, uh, um, healthcare, education, et cetera. So to your question, what do we, what is the state? Well, the good. Canada, I think, is in an enviable position. Many countries around the world look to Canada as an example for infrastructure renewal. Uh, if you look around the world, Caroline, not to take too macro a picture, but we went through a huge wave in much of the developed world of investing in our infrastructure in the post-war era. From the 50s to the early 70s, there was unbelievable investment in all types of infrastructure and really it, it was the foundation for economic growth. It was the foundation for the kind of economies and societies we live in. But then we went through a long period in Canada and other parts of the world where we failed to invest enough in maintaining the infrastructure we had built, which is often a problem. People build it and then don't put the money in to keep it uh, refreshed and to, and to continue to build as we grew. And so by the early 2000s, we were like every other country in the world had a real problem of an infrastructure deficit. And so the good news is we recognize that I think in Canada earlier than many jurisdictions did, there's been a sustained reinvestment in infrastructure. If you look at investment relative to GDP in building new infrastructure, Canada has been among the world leaders over the last 20 years. That's been true at the federal level, the provincial level, and the municipal level. Um, Infrastructure is often, it's interesting, it's, it's owned often at the municipal sector or the provincial sector. The federal government, where, including where the CIB works, is the owner of a relatively small proportion of our infrastructure, but a funder of quite a lot of infrastructure through transfer payments to provinces and to municipalities. So all three levels of government have actually done a really good job. That's the good. The, the challenge, of course, is we still, I think, have a persistent gap between what we need to be a fully productive economy, to be a, a high functioning society. What I mean is to have both the, the economic productivity we could have, there's infrastructure that would really support us and to have the social cohesion and the quality of life we'd all aspire to, the infrastructure we still are missing. And we're limited in what we can build by what we can afford. And I wish the problem was more complicated than that, but at the end of the day, infrastructure is an investment. It's an investment, as I say, in building the economy and society we want. And we're limited in how much investment we can make. So the challenge we continue to face in Canada is how do we accelerate the build of infrastructure? How do we get more built? And how do we make sure we invest in the stuff we do build to keep it current and fresh and long lasting so that it doesn't deteriorate? As we all know, that's the second problem in the infrastructure world is building it and then not keeping it fresh. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I could definitely see uh, what the challenges are. How's Canada doing in terms of meeting those challenges? Um, you know, where, where are we at uh, from where you sit? And, you know, what, what kind, kind of projects are in the works right now? Well, I think, I think we've come a long way in the last, as I say, in the last 15 years. And I think that's true at all levels. I think provinces have made decisions around how to get infrastructure more built, more quickly, more cost effectively. And in my old role at Infrastructure Ontario, that's a piece of that puzzle. Certainly the creation of the CIB, I think, is a really important step. And it's a, it's a recognition, as I say, 
that we can't afford to build everything the way we traditionally have. We can't afford to build everything out of the tax base. So I think the CIB is a great example of the kind of innovative things we're doing in Canada. It's what attracted me to the role and, and, and got me excited about the opportunity to find new tools to get more built, to grow the pie and to in, in, enhance or accelerate our investment as a country. So I think we're doing really well in terms of coming up with new ideas new ways of thinking about infrastructure. We've also got world-class, Caroline, uh, infrastructure ecosystem. And Canada, we have this incredible thing happening in Canada. We have construction companies that are really building expertise in various elements of infrastructure. We have uh, institutional investors. We have some of the most sophisticated, largest, and 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 active in the infrastructure space, pension funds in the world housed here in Canada. We have you know, a legal profession, an accounting profession, and other professional services that have both in Canada but around the world built a real expertise around infrastructure. So my point is that ecosystem is strong and then we're doing things like the CIB to, to leverage that ecosystem to get more built to the benefits of Canadians. So uh, what are you focused on right now at the Canada Infrastructure Bank? So we look at, it's interesting, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is just a tool in the toolkit. And so if I were to describe it this way, there's some infrastructure that is funded by public, uh, by the public, funded through the tax base, and it always will be. That's how we build our schools. It's how we build our hospitals. And so that's not our focus. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that you and I benefit from today that is privately funded and leveraged. The Wi-Fi you and I are using probably if you live in an urban area like I do, um, was a private investment by a private company. There's a tranche of infrastructure in the middle, though, that is partially economic, that can pay for itself, at least to some extent, but may not fully get there on its own merits or be done by the private sector absent some intervention. And that's what the CIB is designed for. So we're focused on tranches of infrastructure where there is an economic case, there's some amount of payback, but the economics don't work to the extent that the private sector is off doing it on their own. If they were, you wouldn't need us. So that's where we're focused. And that brings us to five key areas of infrastructure that we think meet that definition. One is in public transit. Public transit has riders, it has users, it has development that happens around it. So there's lots of forms of revenue, but they aren't enough to pay for transit. Nowhere in the world does transit fully pay for itself. So transit would be a great example of that. Trade and transportation corridors are another. So you think of how investing in a port or in a trade corridor enhances economic value, it grows the economy, but again, doesn't fully pay for itself in many cases. That's the second. The third is broadband and digital infrastructure, especially in northern and remote and less dense parts of Canada. We're a big country. Not Although you and I are probably on broadband networks that were privately funded, that's not going to make sense in all parts of our country. So, But again, there's a partial economic case. So that's the third. Fourth is clean power renewable energy, battery storage, clean transmission. These are all ways of, of making sure we, we get to our climate goals. And again, they're investments that have an economic case, but we can often enhance that. And then last is other areas of green infrastructure, by which I mean things like water and wastewater. Um, these are areas where we can invest, again, to get both green outcomes, but also economic outcomes. So those are the five areas that CIB is focused. We've made in, in our existence, we've made 15 investments so far. We've made uh, investments in all five of those sectors I just mentioned now. Uh, we're up to over $4 billion of our money invested in, those, in projects in those areas. The total project value is something in the area of $14 billion. So the way that works is you'll, there'll be four and a bit billion of our money. There'll, there's something like close to $6 billion of private investment in those projects. And there's about $4 billion of other levels of government, which might be in the form of a grant or also a loan. So the other forms of public money. So you've got the CIB partnering with a province or a municipality in some combination of grant and loan, and then the private sector. And together that's make, taking those projects that might not have been economic and bringing them to an economic level where the private sector can do them. So that's what we're focused on right now. Okay, so let, let's look a little bit more closely at the economics, and obviously a really big part is private capital. How are you attracting private capital? And as adjacent to that, what are you hearing from the private capital market in terms of where their interests lie in infrastructure? Where do they want to be? 
Yeah, so it's really interesting. The, the mandate of the CIB is to attract private capital. Sometimes I think a better expression would be to say to enable private capital, because in most of these projects, there's a, there's a latent demand already. You know, I think of a project like uh, Valley Fiber. It's our first broadband investments in Southern Manitoba. Valley Fiber is a really neat entrepreneurial Canadian company backed by large institutional investors, by the way. So they're a neat Canadian success story, but also global pools of institutional capital who had a plan to get high-speed fiber to a whole bunch of communities in Southern Manitoba, where again, density and population means it's not purely um, the math, the pencil, the math doesn't pencil, if you will, on their own, but I didn't really attract their capital. I enabled it. So the CIB by being involved, we can loan. So in that case, we're making a loan to them. It's long-term, it's stable financing. It's, it allows them to manage the early years, ups and downs of customer attraction. Um, over the long-term, we'll get paid back. It's a way for Canada to have enabled that project. It's not a grant. We're going to get paid back our loan. We'll be able to then invest that again in the next project. So there's a cycle to that. So only to say attract or enable private capital, you have to think of it in both ways. But to answer your, so that's that's an important context. The, the way we're doing that, we, we are, it's, it's really two ways. One, we are... Um, talking to pools of private capital all over the country, both institutional investors, but also entrepreneurs. So in the case of Valley Fiber, they were both, right? You had a company who was in that space and they have, they're backed by a pension fund. We're doing, we're having the same kind of conversations with energy companies, with, uh, with people in the battery storage and renewable space, with shipping companies. So all the way through those five sectors, we're talking to pools of capital about their projects and how we can enable them. Number one. Number two, on the attraction side, we're looking at priorities, things like transmission. We know as a country that we have an incredibly lucky position uh, with in terms of our, our clean supply of clean power. About 80% of Canada's power today is clean um, through a mix of hydro in some of our provinces, um, wind and solar, nuclear in a number of uh, jurisdictions. But it's spotty, right? Carolyn, we have some some provinces that 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 have 100% clean, and some that that their historic base is less so. So transmission is the tie that allows that to flow and allows us to benefit as a country from those things and and to displace uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we look at that and say, look, there's an investment thesis, if you will. It's clear that that needs to happen. So we're going to go out and talk to utilities, uh, investors in power lines, investors in storage projects, and figure out that solution. So that's what we're doing. Uh, so we're both enabling and attracting, and it depends on the sector a little bit, how proactively we're out, we're out enabling versus, uh, we're out attracting versus where we're working with existing, you know, pools of capital. Um, how's it going? It's going, it's, it's been incredible. As I say, we've really in the, in the last year, I think, gotten a lot of traction. The, Early the start of the CIB was challenging. We had to there's for a couple of reasons. One, these are projects that, as I just described, weren't happening otherwise. So it's not people sometimes say, well, you know, look for shovel ready projects, and that's actually explicitly not our mandate. Our mandate is look for projects that wouldn't happen absent an intervention. So there was a natural couple of years where you're going to ramp up, build a pipeline, if you will, or a funnel of projects to pursue. Um, build relationships in the market. So that's that was natural. And I think the other thing, though, is a recognition by us at the CIB that if you only focus on the home runs, on the mega projects, it's going to be um, spiky and you're going to have lulls and then make massive bets and then nothing for a while. And I think any of your listeners would know as an investment strategy, that's probably not a perfect way to run a portfolio. So we made a pretty conscious change a year ago to balance, rebalance the portfolio across time horizons, across deal size, across sectors to make sure we are getting real diversification in the CIB's portfolio. And that's led to, so that's the second thing between just the natural work of priming the pump, but then also a pretty conscious change in our, in our strategy around how we think about a portfolio investments that's what's led to the last year being totally different and busy and, and, uh, and the investments that I described to you earlier. Yeah, so um, our research at Canadian Leadership Congress uh, 
notes that 65% of Canadian pension investors are um, looking to boost their allocations to infrastructure. So um, you, you have an audience of uh, pension funds here today. What would you like to say to them um, about uh, infrastructure in Canada and, you know, ways they can uh, get involved and invest in it and in a way that works for them as well. Right. So uh, um, it's fascinating. W one of the things you'll have noted from the first bit of our conversation is I, we are very focused on building new infrastructure. And one of the challenges that we see sometimes is that, uh, as you mentioned, your, your statistic, many who want to increase their allocation, they are often looking for brownfield mature investments. They're more stable. They're more predictable. Um, many institutional investors don't want to be in the project delivery business. And I understand that completely. And I think the, this, the answer is uh, to that is there's a real balance. So the, the first advice I would give is I think Canada is a place that's going to, for the long term, this isn't, as I said, it's all levels of government. It's all parties of government. It's not a political issue. Our need for infrastructure is vast. And we've got a really high functioning system. Look at the look look at other jurisdictions who are struggling with this much more than we are. So what I would say to, to, to pension plans is if you're looking to boost your allocation, what better place than Canada for all the natural reasons of currency matching and all of the natural hedging that it gives you. But more importantly, we have a really high functioning uh, environment. Infrastructure investment is going to continue to happen. Number two is it's going to happen if you want to be active in the Canadian infrastructure, you do have to think about both greenfield and brownfield. Think about building platforms, maybe where growth can happen, platforms where you can make investments that then allow you to participate in the process of us investing in the next generation of infrastructure, because that's what we're really focused on is how do we build those things that will uh, further advance us as an economy and a society. So that's the kind of partnership that I would love to see. We've had incredible examples of this, right? You look at the REM project in, in Montreal, the first CIB investment, which was really developed with CDPQ infra or with the CAS. And you know, they're an example, I think, of a pension fund who sees the opportunity of both investing in mature assets, but also being part of that next wave of investment. And uh, so I think there's a ton of opportunity for, for Canadian pension plans who are, who are thinking this way. So Canada's obviously, like many countries around the world, committed to cutting uh, carbon emissions. What role uh, do you see infrastructure and specifically your organization playing in supporting that goal? Well, it's interesting. We started this conversation, I was talking about defining infrastructure, and I talked about the five sectors where the CIB is active. Um, for each of those sectors, so this is transit, transport and trade, broadband, clean power and green infrastructure, we start by actually saying, what are the outcomes that we're trying to deliver? I mean, obviously, we're trying to get new infrastructure built, but that infrastructure has a reason, you know, like transit. Why do we build transit? Because it allows freer flow of people. It reduces commute times and makes our cities more livable. It also reduces yeah. GHGs. Why do we invest? You know, they, so there's a why underneath each of these things. And we've set from those some outcome targets. And so the CIB now has clear targets around each of these things. So that includes GHG emissions, transit ridership, number of homes connected to broadband that don't currently have at minimum 5010 functioning speed. It includes an outcome around indigenous benefit and participation of infrastructure. So we've set a, a core set of, of outcome targets. And as I mentioned, the first on that list is around GHG reductions. So we look at each of our investments through the lens of those outcomes. And we've designed a number of our programs specifically focused on them. So things like zero emission buses, we've been getting a lot of traction. This is a great example of the kind of investment the CIB can facilitate. You invest, municipalities run transit systems and there are thousands and thousands of bus, diesel buses on our roads every day. And Investing in an electric bus actually has a great economic case. There's a higher upfront cost. It's about double the price. You gotta invest in some charging infrastructure as well, but the running cost of the bus is significantly less. You have save on fuel costs and also they're much easier and, and more cost effective to maintain. So we, um, we look at that and say, well, there's a form of revenue, if you will, there's a form of repayment. 
we're willing to invest up front with a municipality or with a school bus operator and other big owners of buses and fleets. We're willing to invest with them and to share in the risk and the upside of the savings that come. And that's how we'll get paid back. So we, that's a program we started very specifically focused on the idea of how can we bring our financing tools to reduce emissions. We look at the big pools of emissions, transportation, diesel fleets is one of them. Then we look, as I mentioned earlier, at transmission and clean power as a second. That's why we've done things like our Oneida battery storage project. It's the largest battery storage project in Canada, one of the largest in the world. And again, a real success story of Canadian entrepreneurs combined with Canadian capital with the CIB playing a supporting role. And I think we will continue to look at all of our investments through those lenses of outcomes, including GHG emissions. Okay, so um, you mentioned Indigenous projects. Um, it's something we've talked about at uh, a lot of our events and a lot of our, our delegates are really interested in this topic. Um, you, you mentioned that you provided some support for Indigenous product, projects against Canada. So what sorts of uh, uh, projects have you worked on? What does that look like? We, early on, as I said, when we look at outcomes, one of the outcomes that we the government set for us was around Indigenous benefit and Indigenous participation in the infrastructure renewal that's taking place. And as you well know, um, if we have an infrastructure gap in this country, it is many times worse in Northern and remote, remote communities, just given our, our geography, given, given our history, um, it's a really clear gap. So there's two things we've done. One, every project that we do, we look at the whether there's any opportunity for Indigenous participation. Um, could be as equity investors, could be as part of the construction or operation of the project. And we have a number of those. The Oneida Battery Project I mentioned earlier is an incredible one because it's a partnership between uh, NR Store, Canadian uh, entrepreneurial company, and Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation. And together, they're developing the project. They're equity investors in the project. So that's one form. And that, that the CIB, um, we're happy to partner with the, with the two equity developers in support of that project. Um, on other projects, we are asking the question earlier on, is there any opportunity? Here? Hey, this is a, a transmission project. It's going to go through traditional lands. Is there any opportunity for Indigenous participation? So that's one way that we're doing it. And we're looking at every project and at least asking the question. And besides Oneida Battery, we have other large scale projects like the Kivalik Hydrofiber Link, which again is championed by, by uh, Nunavut and the KIA. Um, so those are, I would say, large scale projects that have indigenous participation or ownership. The second thing we're doing though, is to say, why is the infrastructure gap not getting closed in communities? Because those types of projects, the Oneida battery storage, the Kavalik hydro fiber line, uh, large broadband projects in the North, those are great, but they don't address some of the very on the ground in community challenges of being on, on generator power, not having broadband in community, insufficient clean power and, and water, for instance. So the other thing we did is we, we've created a specific investment stream. We call it our Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative. That's to recognize that this, many of the same tools and approaches the CIB is using are relevant, but we need to scale them to the size of communities. So to put that in context, our typical, our target investment is $100 million of CIB investment. That's just not a practical way to approach a, a helping a community of a thousand or 600 people uh, get off diesel and get to clean power. So in our indigenous community infrastructure initiative, we're investing along with communities and the private sector in projects between five and $50 million. And we think Caroline, one of the things that we, we think about over time is how we might do those projects and then bring them to scale. First of all, in two ways, one water projects, there may be a lot of repl replicability Two is we might be able to eventually syndicate those as a package and to bring in more private capital down the road if the CIB takes a bigger position earlier, gets those, sub, those projects done and can pool a group of them, a group of clean water projects, a group of off diesel projects together, a group of communities together, and then go and take those to the capital markets. So that's, that's the, 
two streams of thought. One is how do you make sure at least you're asking the question and exploring the opportunity for Indigenous participation in large scale projects? So there are many sophisticated Indigenous uh, sovereign wealth funds or investors, development corporations that can participate in our projects. And the second is how, did, how we have scaled our, our approach to the community needs where the CIB is probably taking a larger upfront capital. Uh, there, is, there are private sector investors as well, but then we think about the opportunity to potentially syndicate down the road. We've done the first of the, of the latter category, that ICII, the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative I mentioned. We have made and announced our first investment. It's uh, in a railway in Northern Quebec and Labrador, the Schwetten Railway. It's a fantastic example of Indigenous owned infrastructure. It's owned by three communities and services those communities and also an industrial user, a mining, mining in, in Labrador. So that was our first investment. And it, it, is, it meets all of those criteria, Indigenous ownership, employment, capacity building. Uh, so that's that one we're really proud of and we think it's the first of many. Great. That's excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron, uh, for the terrific insights around infrastructure in Canada and some of the things you're, you're working on. It's been really, uh, really enlightening. And I really appreciate your time and uh, your comments today. Thank you. Well, and that wraps this week's Monday Minute. Don't forget to send us your questions and we'll get right back to you with uh, Aaron's response. Um, if you do have any questions, just send them to us. And I thank you all for taking your time to join us today and, and we'll see you at the next Monday Minute. Thanks so much and thanks, Aaron. Thank you.